thinking about speaking and words, remind yourself how great your God is all the time. No matter what you're going through, no matter what, what life throws at us, we can know and proclaim and affirm that our God is great. And tonight from 1 Kings 19 is an example of how great God is. Um, actually, in the previous chapters, uh, Elijah, the um, prophet, had actually defeated all the other uh, prophets, gods, that were uh, competing with our God. And so Elijah has this magnificent opportunity to show and prove who God is, and it's a great story. You want to go back and read that. So it's, an, it's an, a wonderful story about how God's greatness is, how God showed up, performed a miracle right before everybody's eyes, and people became believers in our God as a result of that. And then in 1 Kings 19, which is where we're going, what essentially happens, however, unfortunately for Elijah, no good deed went unpunished because Jezebel, uh, who was quite jealous of God and, and Elijah's power, decides that she's trying to want to kill him off as a result. So being a prophet was a dangerous business to be in. And so... This, the fact that God had shown himself to be greater than the gods that Jezebel had actually uh, worshipped, uh, as a result, she wanted to have Elijah done away with as a result of that. I'm going to go to the first verse. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel what, the, what Elijah had done and that he had slaughtered the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods also kill me if by this time tomorrow I have failed to take your life for those you have killed. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the desert, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around and saw some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, for there's a long journey ahead of you. So he got up, ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah. Elijah replied, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you and torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I alone am left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I alone am left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord, Lord told him, go back the way you came. Travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, 
son of Zephat from Abel to replace you as my prophet. So it's a long story, but it kind of gives you an idea of a, what it's like to have a bad day as a prophet. And um, he essentially, we find all the things that had gone wrong for the Israelites, how they defied God, how they turned away from God, how all the other prophets that came before Elijah, all of them were gone. Elijah had plans to bring people back to God. And he performs this, an awesome miracle to prove that God is real and God exists and God is someone to be praised and worshipped and God is greater than anything in our life. And yet, as a result, he gets hunted down by Jezebel. But what really happens to Elijah more than anything is he, in his own mind, thought it was over. He gave up. He was got to the point where he wanted to just quit. He felt like he had enough. And I don't know about you, life kind of gets that way sometimes. But what transpires for Elijah, it often also transpires for us. He began telling his story about how everything was awful, how bad it was. He was alone now, and he, he figured this is the end. And so he makes a decision because of his thought, whatever he was thinking about the negative things that had transpired, he felt as though there was no future for him. There was no future for Israel. God was done with him, and he might as well just give up and lie down and die. But we see through the scriptures what transpires. And what I know about this, that no matter where you are on your life journey, and no matter what story you begin to tell yourself about how awful it is, and sometimes things can really get awful. It can seem like it's the end. It can seem like you can't take anymore. It feels overwhelming. You feel as though perhaps God has deserted you and that God isn't really going to win in the end at all, and you might as well just give up. What we tell ourselves matters. And so when we tell ourselves it's over and done with and we go in the opposite direction of God and we want to just, you know, go away into a cave and stay there and, you know, just give up, what we see is God's pursuit. God pursues through the angels of God. God sends someone to give him something to eat, which is bread, of course, which is, of course, the, the bread of life God feeds uh, Elijah and then gives him water to drink the two things that are in sustenance spiritually speaking bread and water are also the life-giving uh, source of life for Elijah but giving him something to strengthen him in the physical first and foremost and then he tell you know there's a command given to Elijah get up and eat so you've got a long journey ahead of you and so Elijah obeys what he hears Sometimes what all of us have to do in the middle of whatever storm we're in and whatever condition we find ourselves, when we feel especially alone, like we're the last person on earth that, that is going to go through this spiritual struggle trying to do what we can, or you just feel as though you've been deserted because of the circumstances in your life, God wants you to continue to get up, to get up, and if nothing else, feed yourself you know, in a physical sense, but feed yourself spiritual words, spiritual things. And what we find Elijah does is he tells his story so much to himself that that's what keeps him stuck where he is. But we also see God intervening. God sends an angel once, twice, and just says, come on, you can get up, get, let's get moving. You know, something about being in a place where we're stuck Movement matters. We need to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And what God does is he asks him to come to the mountain of God. So God is going to meet with Elijah to, at the place where Elijah knew God existed. Uh, also for Elijah, his calling had taken place at Mount Sinai. So essentially he's going right back to the beginning of where God had called him. And what we see here is we always, when we're alone and when we feel deserted, if you will, or if we feel as though we're overwhelmed and overwrought and then mentally we're telling ourselves, this is it. We make all those kind of word comments to ourselves. That's the time we need to pick ourselves up and find our way back to God. And, you know, that's when you need God the most. 
So although we sometimes get drawn away because we can sometimes get within ourselves and in our own head, and, and we sometimes feel the last thing we want to do is go to church or talk to somebody to ask for help, whatever the case might be, we have to, God is going to put someone in your path, perhaps, I pray, to cause you to still get up and get a move on. And the other side of that is, that's the time when in that aloneness, that's when God approaches us. I don't ever believe that we're ever truly alone ever. And even in the thought patterns that we sometimes have when we get to a place of depression or sadness or aloneness or, or feeling beaten up and beaten down by life and we're in a place of fear, doubt, when we've been disappointed, when we're in a place of despair, that's the time in that aloneness when God shows up. And what we see here in a way is a communion that the angel of the Lord has with Elijah. Bread, water, and says, come and meet with me. And what we see transpire is as even though Elijah's in that cave, God asks the question, what are you doing here? What's going on? How can I help is essentially what God's doing. And that's when Elijah proclaims what's going on. Sometimes we absolutely have to admit where, how low we've gotten. We have to say that to God. I'm at my wit's end. I can't take this anymore. I need your help. That's okay to do that with God because that's why he's asking that question. He wants to know what happened here. You just performed this awesome miracle with me and now you're at a point of, de of desolation and, and despair. And so God meets with Elijah. And you notice he doesn't do it in all kinds of noise with an earthquake or fire or wind or anything spectacular. It's the gentle whisper that God puts inside of our ears very often. It's a soft voice of tenderness. It's the way Jesus always communicated with people. One-on-one, -on -one, right there with them, not shouting, not screaming, not yelling. Not saying, well, get over yourself, what's going on here? Come on, knock it off. It's more of a gentle, it's a gentle whisper. And then what we see God do, you know, Elijah recognizes that voice. And that's why each and every one of us must always have a communion time with God where we know the very voice of God. And even what's whatever swirling around us at the time and even our own thoughts can, can get in our own way. We can get in that place where thoughts become our reality and we think it's real. Uh, that's the, the power of the mind, unfortunately, sometimes. Even in the midst of all that noise, even in the midst of everything, suddenly God speaks in the hush, in the quiet, in a gentle voice, in a whisper, so that it catches your attention. And that's how Elijah knew, one, he knew the voice of God, but he also knew in his heart that, that that moment, all the noise inside his own head just dissipated. And, you know, sometimes uh, what happens to us is our own voice becomes louder than God's voice. And when God wants to speak, he has to break through the noise, the earthquake that's going on, the wind that's going on, the, the fire that we feel as though we're in. And he whispers tenderly and softly. And there's an opportunity for communion there where suddenly he's close to us. We feel his presence. That's exactly what happened for Elijah. And so, you know, he explains it. Elijah explains it to God, what his problem is. And God does to him what I believe he wants to do for all of us. He wants us to make a U-turn, where you and I return or turn back to God. And we go back to where we began in terms of what God has called us all to do. Each of us can have roadblocks that come in front of us. Each of us can have something that's blocking our way. We can use that same thing as a way to step on it and climb out over it and go beyond it. And, you know, sometimes the hills that we climb on, actually, there's something that would get us higher in that next level. But what we see is God says here, go back the way you came. Travel to the wilderness of Damascus. He's going to make him travel back and go back and find people that can help him continue his ministry. God had a future plan. Now he tells Elijah what to do next. So you notice here, God doesn't say to Elijah, well, you can't feel that way. 
you know, you, even though you feel as though you're the only one left and you, you know, you just want to just give up, God doesn't chastise Elijah. He doesn't say, you know, snap out of it. He just essentially says, go back and get up, get moving. Go back to where you came in the sense of make a U-turn. Turn around and go back into the ministry that I've called you into. Go back to the life that you wanted to have. Go back and I'm going to have a future for you and here's what you're going to do next. So God puts things in front of us always. There always is a future with God. And regardless of where we are, whether we are on top of the mountain and we had a spectacular miracle take place and then it doesn't turn out so great after the fact because life continues to happen, what we tell ourselves, the story we say, if we say that's it, I'm done, I can't do this anymore, that's okay, you can say all that. What I do believe is true, however, is God's going to come alongside you and say, well, you're not done yet. I've got more for you to do. You don't get to choose <laughs> that, that you give up here. And gently, softly, he approaches us. He speaks to the heart, especially he just allows us to realize we can go right back, make that U-turn, go back where we started in terms of our ministry or whatever that might be, uh, a dream you might have had, a life you had thought of. There's always a new beginning with God. And so, you know, Elijah speaks to me in the sense of all of us, all of us have moments of doubt and fear. All of us have disappointment. All of us get to the point where we get overwhelmed with things. This has been a long year, uh, especially with the COVID virus and all the other things we're all going through. And there's, there's so many things that are happening simultaneously. And many times we can feel like, I just want to get in bed, put, pull, pull the covers over my head and say, that's it, I'm done. That's temporary, however. God's going to peel back the cover and say, uh, excuse me, uh, wake up here. It's time for you to get up, get on with your life. There's more for you, more ahead. For all of you and other people also need us all to encourage them some of us may very well be the angel of the lord that brings bread and water or other or some other physical means uh, words of encouragement words of come on let's do this together let's let's walk this path together there's a there's a road ahead of of all of us that god has planned and that's who we're going to put our faith and trust in so some of us tonight may well need a u-turn in the sense of you're the one that uh, has to turn back to God. I know God taps us on the shoulder all the time. Uh, God never brings us anywhere to just leave us there either. He's always got a future for us. Jeremiah 28, 11. I, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to pro not to harm you, but to prosper you. Plans for hope and a future. That's the word of the one of the prophets uh, that Elijah was also in the same family with. So that's what we have to focus on. God has a future for all of us. When we get in that place, when we get stuck and we think it's the end, I promise you, God's gonna show up, not in an earthquake, not in fireworks, not with the wind blowing in your hair, especially when you're alone. God's gonna step up for that moment. The world will be stilled. You'll hear God's gentle voice, and he's going to call you out of that place to your future. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, we pray for everyone this night who is at a place of need, God, especially needing you. I ask and pray in your mighty name, Lord, that you show up in all of our lives as you always do. May we, God, no longer tell our stories only about all the things that are happening, God, May we talk about how you're good and how you're wonderful and how loving you are and how you are there with us in the middle of every single circumstance, whether we're on the highest heights or the very lows, Lord, you're there with us. And when we feel alone and we feel desperate, God, I pray and I know that you're going to come gently and speak to us all. In the stillness of our hearts, we'll hear the whisper of you, God, speaking to us that we have a future and for us to get up get a move on, and follow you. And you're going to take us to the future you have in store for us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Uh, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, be sure to put something on Facebook on our page around change. Uh, words about that. 
or scriptures, and then we'll also see you uh, Friday night at 7 p.m. for a message and a prayer. God bless you. We love you. Keep listening for God's still, quiet, gentle whisper. We love you.